fear not. <laughs> Behold, I bring you good news of a messiah. Ye shall find the babe. <clears throat> By um, logging on, just go to the church website. But also, you can you can come to the Christmas Eve services that, that we will be, you know, safe and everything. Yeah, we're just social distancing, just, you know, trying to take care of each other. Social distancing? Why are you still standing there? Grab your laptop and log on! Or head to the church if that's your preference and celebrate the birth of Jesus! <laughs> I'll socially distance, but I'm going to church. I'm gonna go to my mom's house! She's got the fastest internet in town! Good morning, church. It's good to be with you once again as we enter into the Advent season. Um, I'd like to begin this morning by taking us back in time a little bit, not far back, back to 1998 to be exact. In 1998, George Will wrote a column called The Happiest Holiday. The article began this way, let me share this with you. It said a sardonic British skeptic of the late 19th century suggested that three words should be carved in stone over all the church doors. The three words are important if true. The article went on to say that on Christmas Eve at the end of the rarely stately and always arduous march that Americans make each year to the happiest holiday, it sometimes seems that they are supposed to celebrate Christmas as though they have agreed to forget what supposedly it means. There are several reasons why forgetting, actual or make-believe, is altogether unfortunate. First, some people really have forgotten, or never knew, or never cared about Christmas's religious dimension, but they still enjoy and benefit from a seasonal upsurge of non-sectarian goodwill. Second, many Americans of faith that assert Christianity is mistaken about what occurred in Palestine some 1998 years ago and in the 33 years thereafter. So it seems to me that this is a case where mainstream writer gets closer to the truth than many theologians do. Barna did a poll recently regarding Christmas and the Christian worldview. In his poll, he actually titled the article, The Christian Church is Seriously Messed Up. As you see behind me, there's a graph. Don't focus so much on the graph. and cherry pick some things for you that are found in the poll. The first question now, and all people are surveyed here, um, all adults, um, evangelicals, Pentecostals, midline, uh, mainline Protestant churches, Catholic churches, born again Christians, others, skeptics, um, then it goes into a political ideology, uh, conservative moderates or liberals. But I just want to focus on the Christian aspect since the survey says that the Christian church is so seriously messed up. The first question asked is, having faith matters more than which faith you have? 56% of evangelicals agree, 62% of Pentecostals, 67% of uh, mainline Protestants, 77% of Catholics, and 62% of born-again Christians. So we're kind of almost on the same page here, but it's going to change. Second question is, you consciously and consistently try to avoid become, uh, sinning because you know your sins break God's heart. 85% evangelicals agree, 82% Pentecostals, 58% of mainline uh, Protestants, 65% Catholics, and 82% born-again Christians. The third one was you have personal responsibility in appropriate situations to share your religious beliefs with people who believe differently than you. Again, 74%, 74%, 48%, 54%, 71%. A little bit on the same page here, we're starting to drift. The fourth one is a person who is 
a, a person who is generally good or does good enough good things for others will earn a place in heaven. 41% of the evangelicals agree with this. 46% of Pentecostals, 44% of mainline Protestants, 70% of Catholics, and only 38% of born-again Christians. And it really gets bad. The fifth uh, survey question was, you consider yourself to be a Christian, and when you die, you will go to heaven. Listen, only because you have confessed your sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. 72% of evangelicals agree with this statement. 55% of Pentecostals. 41% of mainline Protestants. 28% of Catholics. About 100% of born-again Christians. You have to ask the question, what part of I am the way, the truth, and the life don't they understand? And no one gets to the Father except through the Son. I, 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 and that kind of blows my mind. If we were to step back and look at the big picture, and, and of course include all of the, the groups that are found in this research project, it would seem to me that it suggests that people are kind of in an anything goes mindset when it comes to faith, uh, morals, values, and lifestyle. Having read through that, to be honest with you, it took me back to my youth. It took me back into the late 60s, where there used to be a TV show hosted by a man named Flip Wilson. It was a comedy show. During the show, one of his skits, Flip Wilson appeared as the Reverend Leroy, and he was the pastor of the church of what's happening now. This, would, this uh, chart reminds me of. So Americans appear to be creating unique and highly customized views based on feelings and experiences and opportunities rather than working within the boundaries of a comprehensive, time-tested, consistent worldview. If we look at some of the dominant elements in this survey, in the American mind and heart today, as, again, illuminated by the survey, we will find that most people say that the objective of life is feeling good about yourself. That all faiths are equal. That entry into God's eternal presence is determined by one's personal means of choice. And there are no absolutes to God or to grow us morally. This seems to be very strong evidence of how American Christianity is conforming to the dominant uh, secular culture of today. But what if the things we believe aren't true? And how can we be sure? Obviously, according to the survey, there, there were some doubts here. It made me wonder, does Jesus need defending in 2020? Or perhaps we just need to remind ourselves of what we really believe. You see, generally speaking, we tend to sentimentalize Christmas when we ought to see the birth of Christ as the single most stupendous event in world history. Because of the coming of Christ, history changed, literally, from B.C. to A.C. to A.D. And certainly it's no stretch of imagination for us to say everything is different now that Christ has come to the world. So we're not talking about a sentimental thought like the little drummer boy or I'll be home for Christmas. The coming of Christ enables the truth of all that we believe. So seen in its proper context, Christ's birth speaks with incredible relevance to us today in the 21st century. 21st century people who write off Christmas as nothing more than eggnog and candy canes. So my hope is that over the next several weeks we can lay a foundation for seeing Christmas as the basis for all that we believe. So to kick that off as a way of reminder, I want to begin with this observation. The Bible makes some rather astounding claims relating to Christmas. Permit me to share some of these with you this morning, beginning with this one. An angel visited a virgin who became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her womb was the Son of God from heaven. God caused a heathen emperor to call for a taxation 
that sent Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem at the very moment that Jesus was born. But, uh, prophets foretold the truth, or prophets for, uh, foretold both the virgin booth birth and his birth in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it actually happened. A star led the Magi from the east directly to the house in Bethlehem where Jesus was. The Bible says that angels spoke to shepherds, that an angel spoke to Joseph on three separate occasions, that an angel spoke to the Magi warning them not to return to Herod, and even the slaughter of infant boys of Bethlehem fulfilled ancient prophecy. When aged Simeon held baby Jesus in his arms, he prophesied of his death on the cross. And then there are the names that he has given. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, Son of the Most High, Christ the Lord. And then there are things that he will accomplish. He will save his people from their sins. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem, and his kingdom will never end. I submit to you that these are absolutely stupendous claims when you stop and think about them, which we rarely do. It seems that we would rather sing Handel's Messiah than stop and think about what it really means. We sing the songs of Charles Wesley, but we don't really stop to consider their meaning. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Or this verse from another familiar carol, true God of true God, light from et light eternal. Lo, he shuns not the virgin's womb, son of the father, begotten, not created. And you certainly don't hear many sermons about that last verse, begotten, not created. And I suppose that many people probably don't know what it means. Yet it refers to one of the most crucial doctrinal controversies in the history of the Christian church. Important, if true. In the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, brings us face to face with the reality of Christmas with these stirring words. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and have put all things under his feet. Again, Psalm chapter 8, verse 4 through 6. Here we see the glory and the tragedy of humanity. We are crowned, it says, with glory and honor. We are created to rule over the earth. That is our glory. We are made in the image of Almighty God. Listen, once every four years, the greatest athletes in the world meet together in the Olympic Games. They run, they jump, they swim. They hurdle, they wrestle, they fight, they throw, they dive, they lift. And at the end of the day, whoever does it the fastest, the furthest, the quickest, the highest, the longest, wins the gold medal. And for that day, at least, they were the best in the world. That's our version of glory and honor. But that glory soon fades. Records are made to be broken, and sooner or later, every record is broken. All of our heroes end up with feet of clay. Robert Frost wrote about this in one of his famous poems, titled, Nothing Gold Can Stay. Nature's first green is gold. Her heart is hue to old. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. Did you catch the biblical allusion? So Eden sank to grief. In just five words, he described what happened to the human race when Adam and Eve 
ate the forbidden fruit. Sin entered, death became our destiny, sadness invaded the human DNA, and pain moved in next door. We were made for greatness. That's what the psalmist means. We were made a little lower than the angels. Not angels, really, but almost like angels. That's us. That's you and me, a little lower than the angels. But the angels fell, and so did we. The evidence is all around us. We actually see it every day. Just this week, the governor announced that a one-year-old had succumbed to the coronavirus. As I looked that up online, I was amazed at how many articles popped up regarding one-year-old babies being killed in some form or fashion. Just this past Thursday, the local news reported the death of a 15-month-old boy who was killed riding in the back seat of his father's car. We hear the testimony from relatives. You know, they didn't deserve this. We hear them say, this is a terrible world in which we live where things like this can happen. And sometimes we even see it in a personal way. I believe that this is what the poet meant when he, when he said, so Eden sank in grief. Nothing gold can stay. Again, we were made for greatness, for something much better than what we see in this sin-cursed world. But having been made a little lower than the angels, it sometimes seems that we have sunk so low that we are more like demons than we are like angels. Even our righteousness has become like filthy rags in the presence of God. But this isn't the end of the story. Again, God made us for greatness, but we made a total mess of things. We blew our one shot at immortality, and now our graveyards are filling up. But again, God's not finished with us yet. Go back with me to Psalm chapter 8, and we'll look at the rest of the story found here in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? It's almost as if the psalmist is saying, why bother, Lord? with people like us. We ruined Eden. You gave us another chance and we messed it up so badly that you sent a flood to wipe out the human race with the exception of one family. I have to wonder, why didn't God just hit the delete button on the human race? And honestly, no one could blame God if he did, if he decided to get rid of all of us and start all over again. So David's question here comes to the very heart of Christmas. What is man that God should pay attention to us? What is man that God should care about us after we failed so miserably? Why should God care about us at all? The New King James Version renders verse 4 this way. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? So why would God care enough to visit people like us. It's right at this point where we see the glory and the wonder and the mystery of the gospel. So when the writer of Hebrews is trying to impress upon his readers the greatness of our salvation, he quoted these very words from Psalm 8 and he applied them to Jesus. Let me share them with you. It says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see anything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. There's a whole lot here for us to consider. I want us just to focus on three things here. First, Jesus had to become like us in nature. That is the incarnation. That's Bethlehem. This is the Christmas story. He came to the world as a tiny baby, born in a stable, 
in an obscure village in a province of Rome, born in poverty, unwanted by the world, really just another face in the crowd. No one knew he was coming, no one cared that he had arrived. I want you to take note that I said he had to do this. He had to do this in order to truly visit us. He had to become like us. Second, Jesus tasted death because that is our common destiny. Thursday I was speaking with an inmate at the jail and discovered much to my surprise his love and his knowledge of old western movies. And I'm talking back there into my dad's day which certainly opened up a great opportunity for conversation. We kind of bantered back and forth of different movies, and he ended up mentioning to me a movie that he liked that uh, was made in 1967, starring Paul Newman. In the end of the movie, in the climatic scene, the last uh, bad guy says to Paul Newman, he asks him this question, how is it going to feel to go to hell? Newman replies, we're all going to die. It's just a question of when. Then Newman shoots the bad guy, and the bad guy shoots Newman. Both of them end up dead, proving Newman's point, that life is short. The Bible says it's, important, it's appointed unto man once to die. Listen, Jesus could not have truly visited us if he had held himself back from the last enemy that confronts us, and that's death. So in order to be fully human, he had to taste death. Jesus suffered and died because that was the only way that he could save us. So only by dying could he give us life. And third, Jesus came to restore all that we lost in Eden. Jesus came to reverse the curse that we brought upon ourselves. So now in heaven he's crowned with glory and honor. One day, all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will share in that glory with him. But that day has not come yet. That's why the psalmist said, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him in verse 8. Better days are indeed coming, but they're not here yet. Today, we still weep for the little children that die too soon. And we wonder... Sometimes out loud about all the suffering, the pain, the heartache, the sickness, and death that we see all around us. G.K. Chesterton said, whatever else is or is not true, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he is meant to be. And those are true words. So it's precisely at this point that Christmas speaks to us very clearly. We were made for glory, but our glory faded a long time ago. First, we disobeyed, and we died on the inside. And then we started dying on the outside. And then we turned to our own devices. We told God, you know, God, we really don't need you at all. Leave us alone. And we wonder why the world is the way it is. And we certainly know the answer to why Mr. Barna would say that the Christian church is messed up today. God said, thankfully, I will not leave you or forsake you. I will not leave you alone. I will not let you destroy all of yourself, each other, and the world that I have made. God said, I love you too much for that. So he sent prophets. We killed them. He wrote letters, and we ignored them. He told us how to live, and we said, who are you to tell us what to do? So we mocked the God who made us, we broke his laws, we said to him we didn't need him, we made up our own gods that we liked much better because they looked so much like us. Certainly we made a mess of things. And God has every reason to hit the delete button and start all over, but he chooses not to. He says to us, I love you too much to let you go. And after we had trashed everything, God said, I'm coming down there. I'm coming down there so you will know once and for all how much I love and value you. And of course, we didn't pay attention. That really didn't seem to make sense to us. How could God visit us? But he did. 
And he came to the world in a very strange way. That is, he entered a virgin's womb, and he came out as a baby born in Bethlehem. A baby named Jesus, born to save us from our sins. So he came as a baby, and when he grew up, we killed him. We murdered him. We hung him on a cross. That's the thanks that we gave God for visiting us. Again, we were wrong about everything. After we killed him, he came back from the dead, proving that he was right all along, and we were really wrong, dead wrong about everything. And still, God loved us, and he came from heaven to earth on the greatest rescue mission in recorded history. He came because we blew it. He came and we killed him. He died and became our savior. No one but God could have done anything like that. This is an amazing story, the Christian story, and we serve an amazing God. C.S. Lewis said, the Son, of man, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. That is, God has done it all. This is the good news of Christmas. God has done it all. The only thing left for you and me is to believe. So God wrapped up his son in swaddling clothes and he said to the entire world, this is my Christmas present to you. So I have to ask you, do you believe that? If you believe it, will you receive it? Again, going back to the beginning, George Will called Christmas the happiest holiday, and he's right. But it will only be the happiest holiday for those who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me wrap this up with the, th the words I mentioned earlier. Important, but true. Now, I can't prove to you what I've said to you this morning. You'll have to decide those things for yourself. Read the Bible. Read the Gospel. Do some research. Decide for yourself. I can tell you this, however. Without any reservation, I have staked my life out, staked my eternity on the truth that Jesus is the Christ and He is the incomparable Son of God. Christ, Christmas matters because truth matters. At the heart of truth is that God did not leave us alone, but in our misery, He came to visit us one dark night in Bethlehem more than 2,000 years ago. Christmas is all about who we are and who God is and how far God will go for us. Important, if true. At Christmas, we learn how much God loves us. I can't think of anything more important than that. Can you? Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died that we may have eternal life. And Lord, I pray for, for our world, Lord. I pray for our churches, and that we would not stray from your word, that we would be focused on the eternal and not focused on the temporal, the shiny things of the world. The world has plenty to offer us, and they offer us at, at great length anything and everything that would distract us from the gospel message. Lord, from a very special time of the year for us. Lord, I, I pray against that, Lord. I pray that we would take this time to delve deep into your word and fully understand who we are and how much you love us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son who came to give his life for us. Sinners. Father, we thank you again in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. In the meantime, take really good care of yourselves. Be safe. Be smart. Take care of your family. Take care of your neighbors. Um, until we see you here again, we love you guys. See you next week.